Well, hello there, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. I'm Nurse Mo, and I am so excited about today's episode because I finally got to interview one of my absolute fave Instagram nurses, Nurse Allie. So Nurse Allie is a hospice nurse. She's an amazing advocate, and she shares information in such an engaging, fun way. Plus, she makes the most hilarious memes and videos. Like, this girl, if she was not a nurse, she would be a, a comedic actress. Like, she is absolutely amazing. I love watching her videos. She's great. She's got a great energy. She's super positive. And you're going to love her as much as I do. So we're going to dive into that interview. But first, I want to do a quick listener shout out. And I believe this one came through Apple Podcasts. So sometimes it's the person's like Apple name or their, you know, Apple ID name or something. So it, they often don't make sense, but that's okay because I'm going to tell you what it is. It's Kai Fry, K-Y-F-R-Y-Y-Y. If this is you, let me know if I said that right. And this is what you had to say about the podcast. She is an insanely good teacher, great voice, and gives what is critical. It is a reference I will use often, and I appreciate all the time you spend to create these. Also, just bought your planner. Hopefully, it'll help someone as disorganized as me get better. Okay, thank you so much. I know you're super busy as a nursing student, and the fact that so many of you take the time to write and submit reviews about the podcast absolutely means the world to me. And yes, the planner can definitely help you be organized. So if you're wondering what this person is talking about, I have planners for nursing students. I will put the link to that in the episode notes. All right, so we ready to hear from Nurse Allie? Let's do this. Okay, so thanks so much, Allie, for joining me on the podcast. We've been going back and forth about this, I think, for like, I don't know, a year. And we finally wow. made it happen. So yay, good hectic. for us. <laughs> yay, we did it. I, think I just We're have here. to pull out my calendar. like, And once it's on there, shizzle happens. But, you know, yeah. that's just busy. Anyway. So same, same. Allie is a hospice nurse. If you guys don't know her yet, her Instagram, I have to say, can I just talk about your Instagram for a hot minute? Sure. It's sure. the best. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's so much fun. So you guys can find Allie on her IG. And we'll share her IG handle um, later. But fabulous stuff. Not only is she hilarious. Okay, I completely do not have that funny video making gene like at all. But Allie does. And there's also a lot of really great messaging there. She's a fabulous advocate for nurses, for nursing students, and for her specialty, which is hospice nursing. So yeah. Let's talk a little bit about, in general, what is hospice nursing? Because I think there's some, there might be a little bit of uh, confusion or maybe some uncertainty, especially among students about like, what's hospice nursing? What's palliative care nursing? Like, what's the right. difference and what is it? So palliative is just um, like, essentially, they focus on a lot of pain management, um, but you don't have to have a terminal prognosis. So you can start palliative care at any time during your treatment. It's just an elevated level of pain okay. management. That's what I was thinking. But um, mm -hmm. I, I think we even work, in the... Sometimes our patients come over from palliative. Right. Like in the inpatient that. setting, mm -hmm. I feel like there's like, there's That's some overlap. Yeah. Okay. So, and but with hospice nursing, you're actually going out into people's yeah. homes. I think some palliative... Um, programs do that as well. But yeah, we go to homes. So our patients have a, a prognosis of six months or six months or less, which is certified by two physicians. Usually their primary, that could be like oncology, neurology, whoever takes over at that point. Um, and our, one of our hospice physicians. So okay. we have to certify based on certain, um, guidelines for either dis their disease process, um, and their uh, palliative predictive scale that they have a, a terminal prognosis of okay. six months or less. Um, so we go to homes, assisted livings, long-term care, group homes. Um, and then we have, of course, inpatient units, hospice houses, things like that. Okay. Um, so we're all over the place. So that's why I know a lot of people are like, I don't think I could go into people's homes, but like, you don't necessarily have to, to be in hospice. There's also a lot of other roles besides like case managing or even going into homes that you can do in hospice. Mm -hmm. So it's nurses are all over the place in hospice. People just don't realize it. Right. Yeah. I think a lot mm -hmm. of times and especially students, like we were talking a little bit before I hit the record button and nursing school really just try. I mean, it 
I don't know. And this came up in my Facebook group the other day. It like steers, yeah. steers, steers Pipelines students to the hospital to, to and to med search. Like, yeah. To be honest, and like that's that's one of the things that bothers me the most is that like everybody thinks, and I think a lot of professors and clinical instructors teach like you should start on a med search and develop your skills. Like med search is a specialty in its own. Let's right. not think exactly. that it's a place where people start out and that we throw our new grads in. Exactly. Like if you feel like your heart is in hospice or the ER or ICU, absolutely just go for it. I started but, in the ICU. And where did you start? Prison. <laughs> wow, cool. So you started out just kind of outside yeah. the box too. So I was thinking yeah. about this the other day. Like, I think like, okay, this makes me sound old, but what I love about the young people, <laughs> that makes me I sound know, so younger. old, is that the young like bucks. my generation... And people I went to class with, we kind of were like, okay, we, we start out in med surge and we do that. And then we go do what we want. And I think now we've got students who are like, no, YOLO. And I'm going right. to do what I want right from the beginning. So yeah, you guys, you can go into hospice nursing. Um, right but let's learn a little bit more want. about it because I have a ton, a ton of questions. But um, I can't let you say you started working in forensic nursing without talking briefly about that. Can you give us just a brief overview of that real quick? So I, I started out in a correctional facility, a uh, medium security facility for men. Wow. Um, and I was actually dating a correctional officer at the time. So I didn't even realize, like in my mind going through, like they don't talk about that at nursing school either. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I was like, I totally forgot there's like healthcare in prison. Right. Um, and it is a fascinating world. You get a lot of emergent, urgent, you get chronic issues, huge, valuable med knowledge. Because wow. there's a lot of different things going on all at once. There's a lot of also initiative. Like um, we had a couple inmates who were on the trials for a hep C drug. Mm -hmm. So they would have to take it three, three times a day. It was like five or six pills. And actually a couple of them tested. There was no levels cool in their blood oh that God, is so, so cool. cool yeah um what bothered me is when they missed their dose and we had to call them down because if they miss the dose right everything is thrown off yeah. um but like we the thing that bothered me the most as well is we had at the time when i was working in my state i'm from massachusetts this has changed since i believe or so i've been told um they were not allowed to um be like a dnr dni dnh mm. Okay. In prison because they were technically property of the state. Isn't That's that weird? upsetting. That's really upsetting. It is, it is yeah. super upsetting. And I know there are a lot of other progressive states that do palliative care. So they do hospice care. Like my mind is going autonomy, autonomy. It's how does that? Weird. We yeah. have prisoners bargaining. Like I will tell you all of the people that I've killed if you respect my most wow. I'm like... Pfft. What Mind is blown. going on? Wow. And like, I, I wanted to be a hospice nurse before I went into the prison, but you know, I was like, I don't know if I'm independent enough to do it. And in the yeah. prison, you get a lot of like one on one time with a bunch of nurses who have been in the game for a long time. I bet. And that rapid is a rapid assessment in prison is what you need when there's like a critical injury or situation going on. So wow. you get very good at your assessment skills and all, all of the things and we're working with like the bare minimum. So it's just like in mm -hmm. hospice, you're the MacGyvers of yeah. the world. Um, and plus you get to see like a bunch of men in uniform every day and there's like canteen food. So like chocolate covered honey buns. <laughs> <laughs> so you the said same. you were interested in hospice nursing from the beginning. What made you kind of drawn to that area? Yeah. So what, what kind of started it was when my, my, um, grandmother passed away, my last one, and she didn't have any advanced directives. So the last time I saw her was in the ICU on a vent watching her, you know, and, and I don't know, some people might not have ever seen a patient on a vent before. Right. Yeah. But that forced breath, mm -hmm. like, oh, watching her child, it's ingrained in my mind. I don't know how yeah. you guys do it. Like I would never be able to associate or disassociate, I should say, from what I would see on the floors. You oh yeah. The mean? ICU... I mean, oh. I've talked about this a bit on the podcast. I mean, I loved it when I loved it. And it then was, uh... it got to a place. I remember sitting, our unit was laid out so that like the the 
the room, rooms were all like in this long row. And I was sitting at the nurse's station. I was charting and I was just kind of looking down the hallway, like the row of rooms. And I was like, tragedy, 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 horrible, really sad. Tra-. And it was just, it hit me like, I don't know that I need to be in this environment because it's affecting me so, so much. So it's a really tough place to be. And a lot of people, yeah. you know, go on to, um, you know, they die on event. And to us, that was the worst possible outcome that a patient could have. Like, let's have those conversations and yeah, Yeah. and have a peaceful death and not die in this. And that's the thing about hospice is we're better if started early. Right. Too, And people don't realize that like our patients aren't on their deathbeds. They're not like in their last week of life. Usually Mm -hmm. sometimes we do get that case where people come on and then they die two days later because it's Mm -hmm. too late. Right. But, uh, you know, studies have shown that hospice patients actually live approximately 21 to 26 days past their prognosis. Wow. Because of the elevated level of care they get from hospice. Oh, that's Coming awesome. to their home, providing an individualized plan of care with an interdisciplinary team of social workers, chaplains, massage, massage therapy, music therapy, nurses, hospice aides, all of these things, and it's in their home. So they don't have to worry about going to doctor's appointments right. anymore. Yeah, so it's totally accessible. Like if they have an issue, they call us. So like what I tell people is like, I say we're basically like home health, just with a different goal of care, different right. angle, okay. I would say. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do everything. We're going to treat acute things. We're going to do wound care. We're going to manage pick lines. We're going to manage CAD pumps. We're going to manage pleuric strains. Um you know, we're going to do all of the things that our patient needs us to do. We're not going to DC meds unless our patient wants us to. Like people, mm-hmm. a lot of people think when people get on hospice, they don't have any medications. They cut food. Like, no, it's all about what keep, like imagine cutting a blood pressure medication. Our patient might have some effects from that. Like we're yeah. not going to do that. We're, you know, some meds, we need to maintain them. They're not going to extend their life. We know that. Mm-hmm because of that terminal prognosis, but it will keep them comfortable. Um, So yeah, that, and when I was in nursing school, I had quite a few hospice patients um, as my patients. And, you know, some of them were sad. Like I remember one gentleman, he had end stage renal disease. And by the time I saw him, he was super jaundiced. And, um, you know, it was three months before his daughter's wedding. And that was super sad. Yeah. Super sad. And that's when I think like, intervention probably would have been better earlier. But mm-hmm. then I saw one patient, I remember her, her name was Doris, if I remember correctly, probably because she was in her late 90s. <laughs> and she, <laughs> I saw her from like the beginning of her care on hospice when she was still feeding herself, tra- you know, and then a couple of weeks later transitioning. And then I got to do postmortem care. And mm-hmm. for me, it was just a blessing to be there. It was an honor yeah. to be there for her. And like, I volunteered for it. And then that's when I realized like, I'm different from everybody because yeah. most people wouldn't volunteer, but it's an honor to, 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 to do that. Um, and these people just made the right choice. And, you know, we have patients on sometimes who are on for like years because they keep requalifying. Oh, wow. wow. So, okay. Like, they get like a UTI or they fall or they lose like X amount percentage of weight or something like that, or X mm-hmm. amount of pounds. And so that requalifies them, but like, then they stay on and stay, <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, we're happy to see them. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it doesn't matter either way. <laughs> I mean, they're probably, I had one lady who was on for like over a year and she's like, when am I going to die? I'm like, I truly don't know. I'm like, it's not up to me. <laughs> Apparently it's not up to you either. <laughs> right. Okay. So what I'm hearing is hospice nurses kind of have to have a pretty broad range of like skills. Yeah. So what kind of experience would you say, like your experience working in the prison, getting those fast assessments, being able to work with very little resources, that was really beneficial for you. What would be some other types of background experience? Like, let's say I'm a nursing student and my goal is to go into hospice nursing, probably not going to be my very first job, but I could make, you know, a very calculated progression towards that so let's say so for new grads i talk about this so much because my end goal is to end up getting like my master's and i want to develop 
new grad hospice nurse residency programs and more, but there are hospices out there that do that. Oh, there are. Oh, that is cool. I did Mm -hmm. not know that. So like the one I work for now does, I've known, I've researched some for nursing students who want to do it. So I've Mm -hmm. found a bunch. Oh, that's great. I'm thinking of creating a website just so people can A hundred percent. Create a website, just do it. (laughs) It is like an amazing thing. And not a lot of people know about it because they think I have to get X amount of experience. And some, I mean, some hospices will hire new grads without it. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think that's a, a great Thing to fling a new grad into because of that right. independent. You're in a home by yourself. You're by yourself. I don't and even like being be. by myself in the unit when I know there's people around me. Like I still like when something happens. I yeah, get like nervous. We can't like phone, we can't just like wave a buddy down. From right? Down the hall. Yeah. Like we, you can't call out, "Hey, I need extra hands in yeah, here." We have you're, to do like an an awkward step out. Be like, I just need to call somebody really quick. Like. You know, that's mm-hmm. a phone a friend type thing. Phone a friend, yeah. But like the new grad nurse residency programs for hospice are a year long, nice. which is amazing. That is awesome. And they're going to teach you the skills because our documentation is different. Our like our like I said, our goals of care compared to normal mm-hmm. what we learn in nursing school is different. Um, usually, we're on that keep people alive, do right. as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 da. Yeah. That's not us. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we want to keep them happy and comfortable, but we're not doing life-saving measures necessarily. Exactly. You know, we do have our patients who are full code, some of them. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so I would, I always recommend look for one in your area because yes, you can start out as a new grad in some hospices, but I feel like if this is your true goal for your career, get that good footing in. Yeah. A, you know, some people are just made for it and, you know, they can probably teach themselves if they've had like, let's say hospice experience as an aide or, um, with a family member or even, um, you know, they kind of, I don't know what I was going to say. I lost my train of thought. Yeah. But sometimes like I have a, I have a person who is in nursing school right now and they're like, I've been an aide for so long. I'm like, that's great experience because a yeah. lot of our hospice aides are, they kind of have a step in right. to what we're doing. They kind of understand. Um, but, you know, if if nothing like that is around, I mean, I, I don't want to send people into places where I think they're going to be burned out, like long-term care. But we do have quite a few mm-hmm. patients. Home health, mm-hmm. you know, if they can get into home health, because home health is a little bit different than hospice. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes it's not, you know, it's not as... Um, critical, I guess you would say, because sometimes we have patients who need like really good symptom management. Like we do continuous care where we're in the house for like three hours trying to get a patient's pain or symptoms under control. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, home health is a little bit like general. It's like your primary care versus like a specialty. Right. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, But a lot of our nurses, they come from like oncology. Oh, wow. Um, Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. And then we've had a few nurses come from the emergency department, which we love them. They're always super energetic. I'm not <laughs> sure what they put in their coffee. I had one nurse I was training. She used to come off of night shift. I'm like, oh, wow. And then she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to the gym after this. I'm like, do you sleep? Are you okay? <laughs> That's so not me. That's so not me. No, not me either. (laughs) Like I used to get uh, mandated in the prison to stay overnight and I felt hung over the next day. Oh yeah. The entire next day. It was not, not my thing. Do you work Um, night shifts as a hospice nurse? Are there like on call? So we primarily do, it depends on the size of the agency. I started at a small agency. That's kind of how I wiggled my way in. And that's Uh what I tell people to do. Like if you have experience that might not be super related to hospice, try and find a smaller one. Because mm-hmm. it's more intimate, people are um, more willing to kind of. You can get more one on one. You know okay. what I mean? It's yes. not as overwhelming either, because you're not going to be like all over the place and have a larger caseload, maybe. Um, and they're, they're more likely to like want to train people. I love it. Yeah. So try to find like the smaller ones as long as they have good reviews. Always look up the reviews of the hospice. Okay. I mean, just like you would a, just like you would a hospital. Not a hospital, you know right. I mean? Yes. Okay. I mean, I know they're all generally kind of the same, but sometimes hospices, you know, you want to see their employee reviews, like how many yes. are on the caseload and things like that. Okay. Um, but yeah, definitely look for the smaller hospices and that way you can get a little bit more 
you know, maybe a little more wiggle room. That's kind of how mm-hmm. I did it. I was very pushy. Like, I think I called like every two weeks. <laughs> I love it. If I was like, do you need something? Like, well, we're hiring. I think I started out part-time and wiggled my way in that Okay, way. love it. Mm-hmm. So like also like look out for per diem positions too, because it's always a good good way yes. to kind of get your foot yes. in the door of a specialty as well and not get completely overwhelmed by case managing right off the bat. Right. Like I, I don't case manage right now because I like doing weekends and evenings. Okay. Yeah. So usually our on call is like um night shift. Mm-hmm. But we do my particular hospice, we run like a hospital. So we have a group of nurses on evenings. We have our weekend bailer nurses, which that's like my jam. I uh-huh. love working weekends. Um and so because we're a larger hospice. So we have okay. to kind of run that way. Um, like our census is about a thousand usually. Oh my goodness. Which is large. Yes. So we have case managers in the same area, but we have one for home patients, one for ALFs and one for long-term care facilities. Um, so we have one for like kind of each little okay. division in, in the same area versus my first hospice. Like one nurse would just have towns and literally have every patient in whatever facility home wow that was in that town or area that could that could be a lot so how many it patients when when you say your caseload is that how many patients you see overall That's, in a week in a day like what does that refer to so like when a case manager has a caseload they're in charge of x amount of patients so they're mm-hmm. going to be managing them okay they're the main nurse um you know there might be per diems that assist there's Hopefully their agency hires LPNs um, because they're a great resource to kind of help supplement visits. Yeah. And, you know, you want to get an agency that has a separate admissions nurse because you also don't want to be hurting and doing admissions. Okay. Sometimes you might have to help with them. Mm -hmm. They just take a long time. Is that? They can take hours. Okay. Four, sometimes four or five hours, depending on, and, you know, the depending on the agency, the admissions nurse might also do like pre admission stuff. So we have to kind of dig in and see if they will qualify right for hospice. So we have to f- like look through charts, and sometimes these things are like Old Testament size, like <laughs> yes, two out of three. Right. And I'm like, oh god, <laughs> right. And then some somewhere you find UTI within the last six months. Boom, we got it, and you that's it. it. That's all okay. you really need. But sometimes like my agency has a pre-admissions nurse that does that stuff. We had we have hospice liaison. That's another nurse. That's who I that call do. in the ICU when my patient was transitioning to hospice. Like that I I remember talking to hospice liaisons and then and then some magical some magical person would get all everything arranged for for the patient like the transport and make all the equipment and everything so yeah it was a it was a well-coordinated multi-person work triage things like like we have triage nurses who i love them they're so hilarious and not every hospice some hospices have like remote triage so they're not really as knowledgeable but like our triage is like case managers or like former case managers who switched over or like they're out in the field, but then they do triage some nights. Mm -hmm. So they're all in like, well, I don't know if they, they do this now because no, they do this now because of COVID. I call them like my gaggle of gals because they're all in the (laughs) room and they bounce ideas off each other. They ask each other questions. So that's like my, like, you know, you ask the friend down the hall, I call triage. Okay. And I'm like, uh, you guys, uh, like, and then they'll, <laughs> they'll send in, um, orders for us. They'll order the equipment for us. Cause we're driving. So they'll mm-hmm. also call family. Oh, that's if, nice. If we need to like, you know, rearrange a visit because we had an urgent issue with somebody else pop up. Mm-hmm. So they're like, we're sending you here now. We're going to call the family and let them know versus my first hospice, which was smaller. That's going to be my job. You I'm did everything. Pull yeah. I'm pull over. <laughs> but you know, there's, there's benefits. To, now I have to message a lot of case managers on the weekend because there's so many patients that I see all in the same area. But yeah. since they're all, a di- I have to message versus my old hospice. My rep- That's our report is an email. So like, we don't do like a, a handoff like you guys uh-huh. do. We, we email it and they get not love it for me. So like at my old hospice, I had about like two or three case managers. That was at like smallest yeah. email in the world. <laughs> now I'm like, I have like all these, like I have like five drafts saved by the end of my day to email people. Wow. Yeah. Lots, it still it's, lots of paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork. And what I like now is it's electronic. When I started out in hospice, it was, 
it was paper. Yes, I had to which start is with unusual. paper too. Because it was like, we're in the 2000s. So we went from like paper, which was like, we only stayed for a couple months. And then we went to like this fabulous like iPad system. I like, love it. Yeah. So I much faster. It. So, much, so faster. much faster. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. We love okay, it. Okay. So what would make someone like what? I guess maybe personality traits is the right word would make someone like a good fit for hospice. Like what kind of person do you need to be? I guess you have to be somewhat flexible because okay. things are going to kind of pop up that like when you go into a visit, you have like your mindset. Like I feel like in the ICU, it's like you have your schedule. Oh, it's of, control. Right. Okay. It's, it's very all controlled. about the control. I can when tell you. When you go into a home or any, any visit, there's going to be things that might pop up that way like, more variables. Yeah. Like I'll go in, Oh, easy, but I'll get told this is going to be a quick visit. Sometimes, it, sometimes it is, sometimes it is. And then sometimes it's not, sometimes yeah. it's really not. You find all these things that like weren't found on admission or didn't get brought up on admission. Mm-hmm. So you're there like fixing like all of these little floods that happened. Right. And, okay. <laughs> so know, flexibility. Like, yeah. You know, cause like, you know, I have a lot of patients, we have a lot of wounds. We do. We do mm-hmm. a lot of wounds, um, a lot of sacral dressings and um, any nurse knows when you do a sacral dressing, it is Murphy's law that your patient will have a bowel movement. after Absolutely. A hundred percent. Lovely dressing on. So like, I always remember to leave a little bit of time and have patience for that because obviously they're incontinent. They can't control it. It, And there are things that might throw off your schedule throughout the day. Mm -hmm. So like plan accordingly as well. So definitely a little bit of flexibility. Love it. Um, That's good. But I think nurses in general are kind of, we're all kind of the same in a way. We're all Mm -hmm. empathetic to almost a degree where it hurts us. Yes. Um, Very, very big risk for that, for sure. So I would say you have to, in hospice especially, and hospice nurse Julie, hospice nurse Penny, all of them, nurse Marks are going to tell you, set boundaries. Always Mm -hmm. set boundaries because it is very easy in hospice to get your heartstrings pulled. Oh, I bet. Because of the situation. Our patients are terminally ill. Like why, you know, but at the same time, like it is our job and don't burn yourself out. Yeah. So like, say no. What I say is say no. And that's why it's very important to read like your contract, check your call hours, because Mm -hmm. sometimes the biggest gripe I hear from current hospice nurses or why people left is on call was too much. Okay. So if you have a smaller agency, like my last one, it was a lot. A lot of call. Like a lot. Um, To the point where nurses like almost didn't get a break. And we oh, wow. had that's too much. Yeah, we had a uh, a designated on call nurse, but there's always need to be a backup because if mm-hmm. that nurse gets stuck in a visit, someone passes away or something else happens. Um, you know, and like weekends, like mm-hmm. if you're at a, a hospice where they don't have a designated weekend crew, there's going to be a need for an on call. So definitely check your call hours. You should not be on call every weekend or every night. Like you should be doing like one weekend of call. That that would be optimal. That makes sense. That's reasonable. You should okay. be getting most weekends. So learn to say no because okay. they will they will definitely tug at your heartstrings okay. to try and get you to work. Yes, over. yeah. They do that. They do that in any any unit. Yeah. Come help your friends. That's what they say. Come help your friends. I'm like. Mm, this sounds like a management problem, not a not a me problem. Sorry. That's what I'm saying. Like it's not your fault they're short staffed. It's right. really not that they can't make up for it or that maybe they took on too many patients that they don't have mm-hmm. the staff for. Right. You know, okay. that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Being flexible, mm-hmm. having boundaries. Yeah. Anything super else? important. I don't think so. I think most nurses, so, like I said, they're they're the empathy you know, is you, there. The empathy is there. You just have to be comfortable around the fact that your patients are gonna die. What about Most of them. creative problem solving? Like, I feel like, yeah, because well, you're there so, and you've yeah. got to solve problems and you're kind, I mean, you've got your gaggle, you can call, but and you got your, yeah, your trunk is like your supply closet. So like you have to sometimes be innovative. With innovative. Stuff. I love it. But I, I've had to call nurses and be like, yo, I am, I need this. Where are you? 
And like I luckily, like I said, I work for a hospice where we have nurse quite a few nurses in one area. So I do meet them sometimes to mm-hmm. like dig into their supplies. Um, but <laughs> you have to be a little bit of a MacGyver, get used to working in people's homes, um, like an uncontrolled environment. You're right. not gonna have like a bedside table to put stuff on right. or like a nice little nurse's station to document that. And being comfortable, I guess, going into people's space. Space, their personal space. Yeah. And like it's, owning that. And getting, yeah. And not yeah. breaking anything. If you're clumsy like me, just <laughs> bubble. Don't, like, don't touch oh anything. My God. <laughs> One time I was in a patient's home. Yeah. There was a super nice painting on the wall and I almost knocked it off the wall with my back, my bag. So just watch your space. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Just okay. watch yourself. Yeah. Because that would be, that would be embarrassing. I don't think liability insurance covers uh, damage uh, to property. Paintings, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so I want to switch just a little bit because um, even if a student isn't interested in hospice nursing, they are going to encounter patients dying. And this yeah. can be really scary for someone who's maybe never been around that, maybe had a traumatic experience growing up. For sure. Yeah. What? I guess if you had, if you took a student for the day and and you were working with the patient who was actively going to be dying that day, what would you say to prepare them as they go into that moment? So usually what I do is, and this is for the nurses who have never really been in hospice before, because when I think when a patient's active, it's easier to prepare yourself because they pretty much look like they're there. You know what I mean? Okay, so what does that look like? So like a student might not know what that looks like. What would you say that looks like? I guess it depends on the patient, but Mm -hmm. we're looking for a patient who's cachectic. You know what I mean? They're Mm -hmm. usually pretty thin. Yeah. Um, You're going to see modeling. So modeling is like the bluish tinge, usually around the joints that can come and go. Um, you might see like chain stokes for respiration. So like fast breathing, nothing at all. Or like really prolonged periods of Mm -hmm. no breathing. Um, You know, you might hear that death rattle, what Mm -hmm. we call the terminal secretions. Um, And what I remind everybody, including families, is that's that's just the fact that their throat's losing control. You know what I mean? It cannot move those secretions up and down. And it's it's upsetting for people. So I think it's good that you ex- explain it like this is expected. This is expected. It bothers us more than it bothers them. Yes. Um, and here's what we can do to make them comfortable by it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we're going to look for them being like minimally, probably at the active stage, non-responsive, non-responsive. to tactile, verbal. Yes. It, yeah, you're, they're not, you know, mm-hmm. cold fingertips, cold feet, mm-hmm. um, you know, very little output at some point, um, you know, surprisingly people at end of life will still have output because as Mm -hmm. we know, when a person passes away, things get expelled. Yes. Yes. And then, and then you realize, oh, they probably had to pee. Like, because we have to think a lot of our medications cause urinary retention. Mm -hmm. So that's something to keep. That's what I tell them. So we're still going to do our full head to toe, even though a patient is active, Okay, you know, um, as long as we're not bugging them, we don't want to right. make them uncomfortable with it. But like, we're not going to go, you know, we want to listen to lung sounds. Yeah. We're going to listen to heart sounds. Something I might not do is like a blood pressure. What's the right. point? What's it? Right? You're not going to do anything about it. At, at some point, yeah. what I tell people, I'm like, we can't, especially like people who come from like, um, like critical care areas, we can't focus mm-hmm. on the numbers because what are we going to do about them? Yes. You what are you gonna let do? go let go of the numbers if yeah. they're if they're active like yeah things are gonna go down mm-hmm. it's kind of expected it's kind yeah. of expected okay so that's that's what you're gonna see they're gonna be in bed and you're just gonna try to make them comfortable and yeah it looks almost like they're there yeah like someone has passed away it's very um you know, you're going to see sunken in cheeks most of the time, mm-hmm. depending on the patient. Slack jaw. Yeah. Eyes mm-hmm. slightly open yeah. like this. That's something we look for as eyes stay slightly yeah. open. Um, and yeah, that's that's the gist of it. That's something okay. we tell patients, families too. Like, this is what it's going to look like. I think that's really helpful. So they know. So they and know. I think that's I, helpful for a student too, to be like, okay, that all, everything Ali said, I think I could deal with. So now they can go into that situation and feel not so scared. So thank you for sharing we're I mean, we're preparing for it. We know it's going to come. And I think I've been doing hospice for six years. So I'm well aware of what 
it looks like when someone's about yes. to pass away. Yeah. Um, you know, but we do have patients every once in a while who just come out of the blue and mm-hmm. like they pass away without any of those signs. I'm like, right. okay. Yes. No warning. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. One of the things that surprised me when I was a new nurse, you know, working in the ICU, obviously a lot of patients die in that environment was, yeah. was that like some patients go really fast and then some patients take a while days and it's just like, Oh my I've goodness. I've had weeks. Oh my goodness. Because they're waiting for people. Isn't that this, funny? Oh, I've one seen lady. that too. The sun was completely removed from the situation. He was not going to come. No way in hell was this kid going to come and think mm-hmm. about it because of family situation. And it broke my heart for her because I knew, I knew yeah. that's what she was waiting for. And that sucked. Completely sucked. I've seen a lot of the opposite where the family's there, 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 there. And then we finally convince the family to take and a then break. They go. And then, and then, and soon as the family's gone, the patient's like, okay. Those are the ones who like, in their so, life, probably never told anybody what they were like going through, like pain wise, <laughs> emotionally, like they were very, they kept it all in. Yeah. They, they were there. Leave, yeah. They don't want to leave the guilt on their family's yeah. shoulders. Like they are like, I don't want them to feel bad that right. I, they see So they stay away. there for them. And then as soon as they're gone. Yeah. So yeah, I happened. saw that so much. And, and sometimes, you know, we would even tell the person it's okay. You can, you can, you can let go. You, you got to give them their reassurance. And that's mm-hmm. why I'm like, always remember at end of life, they can hear you. Like hearing yes. is the last sense to yes. go. Yes. So people will be talking about things. I'm like, oh, oh, let's step out and talk to that. They're like, yes. but I'm like, I know we're going to talk about it outside the room, not in here. Yes. And then always talk about it. Like they can hear you. Like when I do care, I'm always still going to tell them what I'm doing. Oh, I still talk to it during postmortem I do care. Postmortem care. Yeah. I still Ooh. talk to the people. Okay, so Allie, I want people to be able to find you because I'm loving all the info you're sharing on your Instagram. I absolutely love everything about it. So can you share your Instagram or any other place where students can find you? So Instagram, I'm nurse underscore A-L-L-I-E, Allie. Okay. And then TikTok is nurse dot Allie because apparently somebody took the underscore. And then I also have a YouTube channel. So that's geared toward nursing students. Awesome. I mean, there's some random bits in there because I'm like, let's throw in like paper crafting one day. But like, hey, I that. love crafting. I love it's crafting. A, it's a lot of like talky stuff, but I go over charting, medications, like things like that. Like I'm mm-hmm. not, I'm all about educating the public on end of life. And I think that's wonderful. And I know a lot of my fellow hospice nurses on social media do that, but yes. I really do love gearing towards the people who are going to hospice who might not have an idea that hospice is different. Like we chart towards the decline. We don't mm-hmm. make stuff up that makes it seem worse, but we we chart like we're going to say um, like patient looks cachectic, uh, loose fitting clothing, uh, interphalangeal wasting, um, periorbital wasting. Like mm-hmm. we're going to point out those things those that are things. showing. Yes, the very so specific can, things. I'm like, we want them to stay on services with us. Yeah. So that's okay. what we got it. That's what we got to kind of do. Like, and what's your YouTube channel? What's it called? Nurse Alley. Okay. So I will put all of those in the episode notes for people so that they can find them. And I want to thank you for this. This was awesome. I yeah. I think this was absolutely great. And I hope that you inspired, and I'm sure you did inspire some students to explore hospice nursing. So thanks. Anytime. I hope they, they come on over. If they feel like their heart is there, just find a way. Find a way. I love it. We okay. Want, we want you guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Allie. Thank you. So what'd you think? She's so great, right? I hope that Nurse Allie inspired you and made you think about maybe some alternate pathways if you're not so much thinking that straight to bedside nursing is going to be your path and you want to explore other things. There are so many other pathways to explore. Hospice nursing is just one of them. It can be incredibly, incredibly fulfilling. As I'm sure you could hear, Allie is so passionate about her profession and her patients. So thanks for tuning in to this bonus episode, and I will see you again very soon on Thursday when we're back to our regular scheduled podcast. See you then. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 